Hello everyone, my name is Alex Eaton and we're at the Maitland Regional Art Gallery um, as part of the Safe Space Show, um, which is a touring sculpture show. We're standing in front of my work, Someone Else's Problem. Now, I made this in 2015 as a commentary at the kind of the, the ex uh, well, ex the explosiveness fundamentally of the issue of asylum seekers and refugees worldwide. Now, in the years prior to that, I've been making a lot of work about uh, my own experience. As in, I'm a second generation Australian. My mum and her family fled the authoritarian regime of Abdul Nasser in Egypt back in the late 60s. They came to Australia and were always grateful for the welcome they received here. And under current refugee and asylum seeker policies, particularly the offshore detention, and we're talking Manus Island and Nauru, uh, that kind of warm welcome that my family received to Australia is no longer possible or doesn't have that lovely knock-on effect of reciprocation and gratitude, as well as service. This idea of being of service was very strong within my own family um, and very grateful for the peace and prosperity that we enjoy. So I think, um, one of the most responsible things we can do as Australian citizens is actually engage uh, with our government and its policies to, and question them at all times. Being a political artist, one of the things to do, or one of the challenges really, and the things to do, the, I mean, the things that I want to achieve at least, is to speak plain spokenly to my audience. As in, aesthetically, uh, you understand where I'm coming from, the messaging is clear, and there is no confusion. Um, when speaking of artwork generally, there's, uh, you want to leave a lot of poetry for your audience. You want to be able to the audience to bring their own preconceptions and notions to it and make a decision. So in previous artworks of mine, um, where I'm less didactic, uh, I think there's been pieces where I want to force a decision in the audience member. You might come across a, uh, say a work that I made in 2012 called The Soloist was a man seated, uh, it was most definitely a, a, a man. Um, it was actually my own body uh, carved in a hoodie, uh, seated on the floor, cross-legged, and the, the face was hollowed out. And then there was no identifiers as to the identi identity of the individual. However, you'd get a number of responses. People would either have positive connotations for the hoodie, uh, maybe something towards something more like a Buddhist monks, meditation, that sort of thing, a peacefulness, a quietude. And then there's the negative uh, connotations of the hoodie, uh, whether it be, I think, when in 2012, not long after that, there was the, after making that piece, there was the London riots, where there was a, um, a lot of hooded kids hiding from cameras and things, uh, rioting throughout London, and people had that sort of more malevolent connotation and depending on a predisposition, your own personal history, you might have seen it as one or the other. Um, whereas in the political work, I want to be very plain spoken. I'm speaking from my own privileged position as an Australian citizen, I'm very aware of the, the tenuous nature of that privilege and uh, to be critical of my own privilege as well. And I feel like that's where the more successful work comes from that is political in that way. Um, if we might continue around, I might actually show you some other works upstairs. So this is actually uh, the, the marble stairs of the Maitland Regional Gallery. I believe we're all made from local stone. A beautiful um, record of uh, the, the local minerals. One of the reasons I actually love marble is not only is there this rich history going back to European uh, figurative tradition that we all know of, um, and it's, it's sort of a link to storytelling from my own heritage, but the fact that it's actually beautiful material from the earth, uh, from given to us by Mother Nature, basically. Marble in the scheme of things is really benign. Uh, we use, um, uh, quite a lot of marble in my studio. The dust goes to painters to use as a good paint ground. A lot of the rubble goes to different sculptors for casting. Um, so we, we waste nothing in the process and it is entirely non-toxic. 
uh, so much so that I can use the dust as fertilizer on my own garden. Um, and that's, that's a good feeling in this modern day and age where we need to be very mindful of everything that we use. My own beginnings with marble started uh, at Wombian Caves where I grew up. There was actually a marble quarry there that ran for a hundred years It had a beautiful soft, uh, softer marble which came in a, a variety of sort of gentle linen colours right through to a kind of hard rust red right through to a, um, a kind of blue grey. I started to carve down there when I was eight or nine years old with my dad's wood chisels until he had enough of it and gave me my first set of stone chisels. Now I didn't know at the time that it was a material that I was going to continue to make and work with for the rest of my life. It was only post university graduating art theory and history that I realized, oh, there was this one practice that I really enjoyed, this one material that actually kept speaking to, to me in terms of its rich heritage and lineage of ideas, but also the idea of doing it in this context of Australia, uh, in a post-colonial context, the stories we tell ourselves now and how we represent ourselves are, uh, are more important than ever. This is the collection of uh, two collectors and they've been so kind to me over the years. Um, they're over, you know, the career of an artist, you evolve, you change, you make work. Um, say in my early years, showing off, really showing off technique and trying to prove as much to myself as to a, uh, an audience that I had the skills or could try to do something. Uh, and so it's lovely when you have the loyalty of collectors who believe in you, believe in your voice. And uh, it's much underestimated just how much, how important that relationship can be over time. Just here on this wall, um, that represents you know, different moments in my own career. From Earlier work, this is a folded t-shirt that says courage on it in a computer game fashion. The idea of, I think in my work, always have asked what, a, what do we consider a society, society's values or virtues? Um, how do we discuss those? From my own um, childhood, I know that uh, one of the few places outside of a kind of setting of religion that we was ever discussed was things like computer games, where it gamified the idea of courage, speed, um, fortitude, strength, that sort of stuff. Um, this is from a 2012 show that I had in Hong Kong. Um, and it was part of, it's called Quartet. It's actually obviously more to do with uh, surveillance. It's a regular security camera. The, I think at the time we're talking about uh, finding a place within the world in 2012, remember, we really had seen 10 years of knock-on effects post 9-11 uh, and 9-11 politics across the world, which uh, spoke to more intrusive uh, personal privacy laws um, in the name of security um, and, a, and a politics that really traded in fear uh, to separate and divide us. And the, the, I think I'd been talking about that since maybe 2006 when I first did a, uh, a man in a sleeping bag. It was a, uh, a work that, uh, again, I always use my own uh, body as a reference point. It's easier and more authentic to talk about my own body as, and use it generically as a kind of stand-in for an every person. Uh, it's often easier to do it that way. Anyway, this uh, particular piece, I would put it in a uh, sculpture show outside a very expensive Philip Stark mansion in, in Werribee in, in uh, Melbourne, outside of Melbourne. And uh, I, again, if we want to talk about that litmus test of, of my audience's disposition, we would have the, uh, I think the concierge was actually the one to tell me this story, came running over and said, oh, look, I really just want to, I want to thank you for, for the, the, the sculpture of the, the man in the sleeping bag out on the lawn. And I said, oh yeah, well, thank you, that's very nice. And he's like, no, 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 it's really interesting to, to get an indication, depending on, you know, who comes up to us, what are, some of our guests are like, oh, what are you gonna do about that poor man sleeping on the lawn? And we'd know that they were a good person. If they rushed up and said, get rid of that guy. 
sleeping on the lawn. We knew we'd, it was not someone we wanted. <laughs> um, but the, the idea that you could push people to almost reveal themselves in art was always been a surprise to me, but there's this kind of different feedback you get from uh, any one artwork and very wildly. It's actually one of the reasons I love art. Now, one of the um, pieces that I did make uh, here is art. And it was actually a, a commission by uh, the collectors here. I was making a large text based work and I think I had made a marble, marble, as in at the words, the, let, the letters M-A-R-B-L-E. Um, and you can rearrange it and you have a ramble or, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun to be able to exchange it. Text can be a really powerful thing. Obviously it's um, better for say my more political work where I want to be explicit and specific. Um, and also I, I come from an art theory history background and I love writing, I love text. The, the nuance and poetry of, uh, of uh, text just works so well with sculpture sometimes. And so I've been known to inlay writing into objects such as uh, uh, one of my first works that I ever got known for was a marble couch. We put it at Sculpture by the Sea, Bondi out in the point there. And it was a, just a good large two-seater marble couch. And it said, this is to, no time to sit around, get up and enjoy the day. And people go, oh. I'm not sure whether they could throw themselves on the hard marble surface, not maybe not knowing that it is because it was carved with all the leather detail and you know, the series of commands between audience, object, and artist, uh, and prompts, I would say, not commands, uh, is something that is really interesting to me. Like something that um, has always in, uh, been something like, uh, well, large influence would be in someone like um, Liam Gillick, the uh, English artist, uh, who loves to play with his, uh, the idea of the note, like all the tropes in theater of, of, of art and the idea of guiding your audience to a, a very specific conclusion or a conclusion of their own choosing. Um, we've got a couple of other pieces here which may not come up on camera, but this just, this is time is on my side and I just need a little more time. Um, both were, I used to write with myself a lot of notes because I, I carved within a um, closed room with an extraction and lots of light and the dust would gather on all the glass and I would write myself little notes when I had an idea while I was working because one of the great things about having a studio practice is that you have lots of time to think. There's, you know, I am not only proving uh, to myself you know, an idea in form, in practical form with my, in, in my hands and fixing that idea down in a way that you don't if you're just in your own head or even simply sketching and writing don't satisfy sometimes. And then I, while I'm making, there's a lot of labor and process and plenty of time for the head to go whirl around and think of new ideas and often go over and make little notes. And I've recorded all of those notes in the dust of the glass. And so these series are actually made, that's not paper you're seeing there. That's actually marble dust within another layer of marble dust captured and then written in reverse on the front of the glass here and then framed. So it's all fixed down. Yeah, that's just a small insight into my practice and how I work. The, um, you know, being, being, all I can say is that being an artist has been the absolute joy of my, my life. It's a lot of hard work, but it's also very satisfying. Anyone that actually ever wants to become an artist uh, who's watching this, I would say that there's a huge community out there of people who are like-minded, who are ready to support you. And you need to, one of the, it's not just this, don't see yourself as this hidden away creator in, in a garret somewhere. You're part of a community and that is also really vital to uh, the con ongoing conversations of what art is and what it looks like and what is of value, um, but also to be challenged by your peers is one of the greatest things that can ever happen. Um, anyway, all by this way of saying thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>